हेलो गाइस हाउ आर यू आई एम हरदीप सिंह वेलकम बैक टू योर ओन यूट्यूब चैनल आल्स अपडेट्स एंड रीसेंट एग्जाम्स फॉर मोर अपडेट्स रिलेटेड टू रीसेंट आल्स एग्जाम राइटिंग दस टॉपिक्स लिस्टनिंग रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट एंड स्पीकिंग क्यू कैट गेस वर्क प्लीज गाइस पार्टिसिपेट इन एवरी डे लिस्टनिंग एंड रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट टू अचीव योर डिजायर बैंड स्कोर इन योर एक्चुअल आल्स एग्जाम Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page Alts updates and recent exams. Part 1. You'll hear a woman calling Laverton Arts Center for some information. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Laverton Arts Centre, how can I help you? Hello. I've been to the Arts Centre a few times recently and I understand you have this scheme for regular visitors. The Friends of Laverton Arts Centre. Yes, that's right. I wonder if you could tell me a little about it. I mean, how much it costs and what benefits it offers, things like that. Certainly. Well, first of all, the good news is that we've recently changed the scheme. It used to cost 15 pounds a year, but now it's free. All you have to do is fill in an application form. You can either come to the art center and do that here, or you can go to our website and apply online. And so, what are the benefits of joining? There are actually quite a few. As a friend of Laverton Art Center, You'll receive a newsletter every three months with information on all the forthcoming events. That sounds useful. You also get priority booking for shows and concerts in the main theatre. Can you explain how that works exactly? Yes. What that means is that when tickets go on sale for the first two days, they're only available to friends of the art centre. So as long as you book early, you can make sure you get seats. Great. Do you ever offer discounts to friends of the center? Under the old system, when you had to pay to be a member, we did. Under the new system, there won't be any discounts for shows in the main theater or films at the art cinema. Having said that, we will be offering some discounts to members for performances in the small theater. There'll be information about this in each issue of the newsletter. I suppose I can find that information online as well, can I? Absolutely. Actually, we're redoing our website at the moment. Right now, there actually isn't a special section for friends of the art center on the website. Once the site's been redesigned, there will be. You'll be able to put in your username and password and enter a special section just for you. It sounds excellent. Are there any requirements though? I mean, as a member, do I have to do anything? Yes, sorry. I forgot to mention that. There are no formal requirements at all. Though obviously we have this scheme to encourage people to attend events here regularly. So, we ask that you attend at least 4 events a year, whatever they are, if you possibly can. Nobody's going to count though, and it's totally up to you. That sounds fair enough. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. While you're here, we're actually conducting a short survey of people who phone up the art center. Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? It'll only take a couple of minutes. Sure, no problem. Thanks a lot. So, 
How many times have you visited Laverton Art Centre in the last six months? Well, I've only lived in the area for the last four months, so not that many times. Um, three, I suppose. Yes, that's right. Fine. And how did you first find out about the art centre? Let me think. Oh, yes, a friend invited me to a concert and I came with her. Have you ever seen a film at the arts cinema here? No, I haven't, to be honest. In fact, until you mentioned it earlier, I didn't realise you even had a cinema. One more question. If we offered a free tour of the art centre, including things such as going backstage to look at the dressing rooms, would you be interested in going on it? Oh, yes, definitely. I think a tour like that would be very interesting. I'd even pay for it. That's great. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You are going to listen to a conversation between two students about preparing a questionnaire as part of an essay assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. I've never written an essay of more than 1,500 words before, Anne. Me neither, Mark, and it scares me. Ah, I wouldn't worry. We'll just have to pretend it's four essays of 1,500 words and join them together. <laughs> It says here in the assignment notes Dr Brightwell gave us that we're to write between 5,000 and 6,000 words on some aspect of students' attitudes, backed up by our own research, which we present in the form of tables, graphs, charts or whatever, and supported by reference to the list of books she gave us. Oh, I didn't realise there had been so many social science books written about students. Oh, yeah. There are a lot. Mm. And the questionnaire? Yes. Um, we have to um, prepare a questionnaire to gather our own data for the graphs, etc. And hand it in to Dr Brightwell in draft form in um, two weeks' time. Two weeks? That's what she said, and what it says here. She says that it's better to have it checked before we go on to collect the information and start the writing. Mm, suppose she's right. We'd better get started then. But she didn't say how we were going to put the questionnaire together. Does it say anything in the notes? Uh, nope. It only says that we are limited to four sides of A4 and no more than 50 questions. Mm, mm, if that's the case... It's not that bad. Before you hear the rest of the programme, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. So, how are we going to do it? Well, first we need to know who we're aiming it at. 
then decide how many questions we're going to ask. I think we could have about 40 questions maximum. I don't think there's any real need to go up to the 50 limit. Mm. And I think we should keep the questions themselves very simple. <laughs> don't worry. In my case, they will be. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a mixture of question types, like multiple choice questions. Yes, no, and agree, disagree, with boxes for people to tick. Mm -hmm. If people are asked to write down anything, it's unlikely they will fill it in. So, are we going to give this questionnaire out to people to hand in, or are we going to just stop and ask them around the campus or on the street? Mm. I don't really know. Did she say anything about this? Um, no, she didn't. And there is nothing in these notes she gave us either. I think we ought to give them out. OK. Anyway, it won't affect the way we design the questionnaire. We're both doing it on different subjects, but there's nothing wrong with pooling our ideas about the mechanism of the questionnaire. No, none. What are you doing your project on? I've been thinking about doing something around the subject of um, how aware students are of world affairs. People think that we're all up to date, but I very much doubt it. Hmm. It would also be interesting to compare students in different years. And you? I'm doing something on health and sport and whether students are more or less active since they came to university. Oh, sounds interesting. As the questionnaires can be anonymous, I'll fill in your first questionnaire for you. <laughs> but I'm sure you won't be surprised by my answers. <laughs> Somehow. I don't think so. <laughs> I suggest we put together about 20 or 25 questions each and then meet tomorrow or the day after and compare them. Mm -hmm. Are you going to type yours up? Yeah. Then I can come round to your place and we can work on them. You've got a laptop, haven't you? Yes. And I've got some new design software, so we can play around with the layout. Brilliant. Are you any good at doing charts and things? I know how to do simple things on the computer, but we'll sort something out. OK. I feel much better about all this now. It doesn't seem quite as bad as I first thought. No. Don't worry, we'll get it done. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear a talk about safety in different regions. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here to talk to you about staying safe on holiday. Before I came this evening, I did a little research on where students like to go for their holidays and came up with two different regions, Latin America and India. So, um, I've been looking at the crime figures for both areas and I thought I'd start by talking a bit about that. Then I'll give you some advice about how to avoid becoming a victim of crime. OK, first of all, let's look at what kinds of crime are committed most in different regions. Um, OK, I'll start with India. Generally... India isn't thought of as a dangerous place for individuals, but there has been an increase in handbag theft in recent years. So keep an eye on your bag when you're out in the street. Right, now let's look at Latin America. Mm. Of course, you do realise that not all Latin American countries are the same, but it is true to say that guns are used in a high percentage of crimes across the region. Looking at the figures, it seems that gun crime is a serious problem throughout. 
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. I can see some of you are thinking that it all sounds rather dangerous, but I know lots of people who've been there and had a really great time. They followed advice from the authorities, like making sure they didn't wear expensive jewellery in the street. And I'd certainly advise anyone travelling to Latin America to do the same. Another thing you should be careful of is not to go to lonely places at night. But of course, that's the same anywhere. But I must say, you do have to be very careful in some parts of Latin America when you take your money out of a cash machine. Sometimes you find that thieves stand very close to people at cash machines and take their money as it comes out. OK, so now I'll finish by talking a little bit about India. I've actually been to India, and I didn't have any feeling that it was dangerous at all. First of all, I went on an organised tour with a group of people. This is definitely the best way to go because it's so much safer. I mean, I didn't go anywhere without the group, and we had a tour guide who spoke the local language and knew the area. In fact, I remember now, she warned us not to go off with strangers, even if they seem nice and friendly. But again, you wouldn't do that at home either, would you? The end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You are going to hear a talk on the writer Charles Dickens, given by a university lecturer to a group of students. First, look at questions 31 to 40. Good morning. My name is Professor Sarah Lennon, and I'm here today to talk to you about the works of one of the greatest writers in the English language, Charles Dickens. He wrote many books, and if we bear in mind that there are over 2,000 characters in his stories, we can get an idea of the complexity of his work. I've selected one novel from your reading list that I would like to talk about to illustrate his genius, namely... Dombey and Son. But before we look at this work in earnest, I thought it might be a good idea to have a quick look at his life and also at a few of the major events that happened during his lifetime so that we can try to put his writing into perspective. Dickens was born on the 7th of February, 1812, at the time when his father was working in Portsmouth Dockyard. His father was transferred to London in 1814. To help give us a picture of the time Dickens was born into, it's worth noting that in 1814, when Dickens was two, the first efficient steam locomotive was constructed in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. Then in 1817, the year that Queen Victoria was born and Waterloo Bridge in London was opened, the Dickens family moved away from London. 
and to give Dickens' life a literary perspective, in the following year, works by other famous English writers were published. Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey and Persuasion, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Scott's The Heart of Midlothian. When Dickens was almost ten, his family circumstances changed and in 1822 the family moved back to London. In 1824, John Dickens was arrested for debt and imprisoned in the Marshalsea near London Bridge in London. This event had a profound effect on Dickens' writing. From 1827, Charles Dickens had various jobs as solicitor's clerk, freelance reporter and newspaper reporter. In December 1833, Dickens had his first story, A Dinner at Poplar Wall, published in The Monthly Magazine. In the same year, the SS Royal William became the first vessel to cross the Atlantic Ocean by steam alone. In 1836, two important events happened. Dickens published the first series of sketches by Boz, and the publishers, Chapman and Hall, suggested his first novel, The Pickwick Papers. In April of the same year, the second major event took place. Dickens married Catherine Hogarth. And in 1837, the year that Queen Victoria became Queen of England and Samuel B. Morse developed Telegraph, the novel Oliver Twist began publication in Bentley's Miscellany in 24 monthly instalments. You may not be aware that serialisation like this was common in Dickens' time. In the subsequent year, that is in 1838, the serialisation of Nicholas Nickleby started and appeared in 20 instalments. Dickens' novel The Old Curiosity Shop began serialisation in 1840. This was the year the first postage stamp, the Penny Post, was brought in by Rowland Hill, and the year the first bicycle was produced. The next major publication for Dickens was in 1842, when the first part of Martin Chuzzlewit appeared, and in 1848, Dombey and Son was published. Now, do you have any questions before we go on to look at this work in some depth? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking, you cut guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material visit my official website www.ieltsupdatesandrecentexams.com. The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material then please join my telegram channel. So guys please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.